Welcome to Ask a Naturalist. I'm Susie Spickle, the Community Programs Director here. I'm one of the naturalists. And um, let's, we'll go around and introduce our Hair Center staff this evening. And we'll start with Miles. Miles. All right. Hi, everybody. I'm Miles. I'm the Operations Manager at the Hair Center. Let's have Brett Thielen. Why don't you introduce yourself? Hi, all. I'm Brett Thielen, the Science Director at the Hair Center. And at these Ask a Naturalist, Evenings, I tend to answer questions about amphibians and sometimes reptiles, too. And Jenna? Hi, everyone. My name is Jenna, and I'm one of the teacher naturalists at the Harris Center, and I usually try to answer questions about insects. Yay! And Eric, I bet you guys can't guess what Eric is an expert in. <laughs> birds, 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 birds. I, I love birds. Always have, always will. Love it. And John, we're so glad you're here. Hi everyone, uh, glad to be here uh, at these events. I usually answer questions about mushrooms and fungi. Uh, you're so fungi. <laughs> I'm Susie and I usually stick to the mammal oriented questions, especially scat, which seems to have been very popular of late. All right, what do you say we get started everybody? What do we got going on? All right, here we are. The first is a video. So we're gonna watch this video. There's not much to the audio, so I thought I'd just turn that down. It's just a windy day. All right. It's a little choppy to see for probably lots of people, but what we're seeing is uh, a turtle um, and a water snake. And the turtle is kind of climbing over the water snake. And so Brett, um, do you want to talk a little bit about snake and turtle interactions and what's going on in this video? And I want to thank Jean for sending it in. It's really cool. And maybe what type of turtle is that? She thinks it's blandings. Any thoughts, Brett? Yeah, and I'm hoping John will weigh in on this too, because he knows more about snakes than I ever will. But I can talk a little bit about the turtle. Um, so at first we thought it might've been a painted turtle. I'm sure you're really familiar with those. Um, sometimes people call them sun turtles. They're our most common New Hampshire turtle with the kind of dark carapace. But then um, we noticed something a little different about this one, which is that um, the, the shape of its body was a little taller. So kind of more helmet shaped. And then right here, as the turtle gets turned upside down, you can see um, on its plash on its underside is not the same color as you would expect for a painted turtle. It's kind of yellowish with black blotches. And there's also a moment when you get a, a glimpse right here um, of that turtle's chin, which looks yellow. And those are all telltale signs that it is a Blanding's turtle, which is an incredibly exciting sighting um, for Jean because Blanding's turtles are endangered in the state of New Hampshire. They're quite uncommon. We don't really have them here um, in the Harris Center area um, or, or they're, they're very rarely seen. They're more seen in the Southeast part of New Hampshire. Um, and so we are very careful, I would say, um, not to share the specific location where this was found because turtles are, are very vulnerable to poaching. And so I would encourage anyone who finds a rare turtle, like a Blandings or a wood turtle, don't, don't share specific location information about it. If you're sharing it with folks on social media, um, and I don't really know why, you know, John, I don't know if you have any thoughts. I've never seen a, a turtle just walk over a snake like that before. Susie, I don't know if you have, you spend a lot of time also. And it's a, it's really um, interesting behavior. It just seems to pay that snake no mind whatsoever. I guess it knows that the snake has its mouth full and is not a threat and is just continuing on its way um, as they do this time of year, probably looking for a nesting site away from the wetland. But John, what do you, what are your thoughts on this? Yeah, I mean, encounter? this is a really interesting little just sort of random encounter. I think it's kind of an example of, you know, ships passing in the night, pretty much just doing their own thing and ignoring each other. Uh, I was kind of surprised that the northern water snake really doesn't seem to move or be too concerned about the turtle walking over it. Uh, it's in the midst of eating a fish and they're extremely vulnerable to predators when they have a prey animal in their mouths. So they sometimes can be a bit more uh, you know, nervous and, you know, um, uh, reluctant to be disturbed, but doesn't seem to mind that turtle one bit as it crawls right over it. 
So yeah, very interesting video. Yeah, that's really cool. Thanks, Jean, for sending that in. That was super exciting. And I loved seeing that interaction. And especially at the end, I was like, wow, what's up with the snake that it didn't do anything? And then I saw the fish in its mouth. So it was just maybe it was just busy eating. And it was like eating took a precedence over it. Cool. Well, thanks a lot. That wasn't really a question, but a great opportunity to share. Let's see what our next slide is. And if there's a question. Ah, this is from Brian. He says, I found this bird egg in Brewster Forest and I would love to know what bird it came from. I'm not a birder and my wife and I cannot figure it out. This sounds like a question for birds, 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 man, Eric. So I'm sure um, a lot of you can probably figure this one out. But if you just look at the um, statement first, I found this egg in Brewster Forest. And so right there is a tell, it's a forest bird. It was, the egg was found in, unless a, unless a, uh, a crow or, or some other scavenger took an egg from a, a different habitat and flew over the forest and dropped it, we can assume that this is a forest bird. And the second thing is if you look at the size of it. And so young chicks um, are, the eggs of birds are proportional to the size of the chick, to the size of the bird essentially. So hummingbird, Eggs are tiny, obviously. You don't need so much yolk to produce a, a bird that's only gonna to grow to the size of a hummingbird, while uh, larger birds like eagles and loons have larger eggs. And so this is a wild, I'm pretty sure this is a wild turkey egg. And another, another reason why I think it's a wild turkey egg is that turkeys are what, what are called precocious. When they nest, the young are almost um, able to fend from them, for themselves from, from the get-go, as opposed to a robin chick, or a, um, a warbler chick, or, or a, essentially all songbird chicks, and they're what are called attritional. A they're defenseless and blind, and it takes them uh, a, a longer time to be able to leave the nest, whereas turkeys and many shorebirds can leave the nest pretty soon after hatching. And so um, you take the birds that um, birds that are precocious. Sorry, birds that are precocious. Yeah, like like uh, turkeys. Um, very often have larger eggs too because they need more yolk. They spend a longer time in the nest uh, being incubated, and so they need more yolk to grow to the the size and with with the with the advanced feather stages that they need before they um, that they need when they hatch. So a turkey, for instance, will incubate for twenty six days versus twelve to fourteen days for a hummingbird. So large egg forest. I'm going with turkey. Thank you, Eric. That was so cool. Um, can I ask you a question? So this turkey egg looks like it was predated, right? It didn't hatch yeah. out. So can you just share what, um, who would eat a turkey egg? I'm sure lots of things. Any lots, thoughts? Uh, yeah. So uh, essentially turkeys, if you, if you look at the turkey from, from above, it's pretty well camouflaged when it's on the hen, when it's on the eggs. And that's important for two reasons. One, the uh, the hen doesn't want to be predated. And two, the, tur the turkey eggs, if you can imagine, and turkeys have clutches up to 14 eggs strong, so over 10, up to 14. And they're pretty pale, uh, almost almost to white, and so they'd be very visible from above. So um, the, the, the hen is doing her utmost to make sure that they can't be found during the incubation, which I said goes through about 26 days. But she will leave the nest a couple of times a day early on in the incubation. Um, before the before the the more investment she puts in, the more tied she is to the to the outcome. So in, early in the in the um, incubation, she could leave the nest twice a day. It's called recessing uh, to go and feed for herself to not endanger her own life. And the closer the the eggs get to uh, hatching, essentially, is the more investment she's put into the eggs by that point, and the less she will leave to the extent that she'll. It's a kind of a trade off between um, eating to keep herself alive and staying on the nest to protect the eggs. So at some stage she got off the nest and either that's a bird that, well, it's probably, yeah, it looks like predated. So, so at some stage she got off the nest and maybe this nest was predated by a raccoon or a skunk or a um, any number of, of, of mammals and birds too, blue jays. And there's so many, I can't even imagine that the length of uh, the, the list of birds that uh, and, and mammals that could have predated this is pretty long. Thanks, Eric. So fascinating. Really, really appreciate it. From the bird man himself, Eric Masterson. All right. Can I let's... ask a, a quick oh, yeah. question. Um, so you observed that it was predated and not hatched. So is if it had been hatched, they, it would have been in two or more pieces. Is that how okay. you made that yeah, assumption? I'm, I'm that's my that's my guess. I'm not a hundred percent certain of that. 
So, um, I mean, someone else chime in if someone else has has more. There may be a turkey breeder in the in the uh, audience, but yeah, very often when eggs are hatched, they're in two pieces. So I, I'm not going to swear this was predated, but um, yeah, I'm not going to swear this was predated. Anyone, any thoughts on that? Chime in, you can chime in on the chat. Also, if they hatched, wouldn't there be a bunch of them together? Well, yes. Yeah. So if this was predated, the, the predator would have, um, I assume the predator would have taken all of the eggs. And so um, the fact that it was found on the forest floor, was it, ne was it near the nest? If it was near the nest, it would have probably been easy to, uh, to find uh, other re remnants. If it was just on its own, um, perhaps an adult taking the shell, the, the shell away from the nest to, uh, to, to um, avoid future disturbance. But I, I don't know, that's, I'm going to look that up. So huh, I'm not sure whether that's, uh, just whether that's predation or, or hatching. Stay tuned. Um, usually we send out an email follow-up with the link to the um, recording. So maybe Eric, if you could let sure. um, let Miles know and we can include some more information on this mystery, double mystery, not just what the bird is, but what happened to the egg. I love a double mystery. All right, let's see what else we got. All right, here is a chance for you to participate. We have a poll for you. So um, this is the question. What should you do if you find a turtle crossing the road? And here are your choices. Okay, should you put it in your car and keep it as a pet? Bring it to the nearest body of water pick it up and move it to the side of the road in the direction it was going or take it to the local animal shelter. So let's see, let's give everybody a chance for voting. So what should you do if you find a turtle crossing the road? And this is a really great question for this time of the year because there's lots of turtles and I'm just gonna put a plug in for all of us to slow down this time of the year near bodies of water and give turtles a chance to get across the road. It always surprises me when I see a hit turtle because I think that was the easiest thing to avoid hitting. You can kind of see it, it's moving slow, slow down. So, all right. It looks like almost everybody has participated. Miles, drum roll. What was the leading answer? Top answer was pick it up and move it to the side of the road in the direction that it's already headed. 95%. Right. And I'm going to ask Brett to chime in a little bit on this. She spends a lot of time on roadways helping not just salamanders and frogs, but um, reptiles like, like this like these turtles. So Brett, what, what's your best advice for people? Yeah. And this is actually one of my pictures. This is the wood turtle I've been out looking for and who I think I saw again today. Um, and yeah, a lot of, this is the time of year when mostly um, what's happening are female turtles who are out looking for nesting sites. And so some people do think, oh, it's a turtle. It needs to be in water. And most of the time our local turtles, um, many of our local species anyway, do spend their time in water, but this time of year, female turtles are looking for dry, sandy soil in which to lay their eggs. And that's what is bringing them out of their ponds and lakes and wetlands and often crossing roads and sometimes nesting right alongside roads because those sandy roads shoulders are um, sometimes the first, you know, nesting habitat that they come to. So in addition to slowing down near water, which is so, so important, basically from mid-May through early July, that's prime time for turtles. Yeah, if it's safe for you to pull your car over um, and to pick that turtle up and to move it in the direction it was heading, that's the thing to do. These turtles know where they wanna go. And if you turn them around or put them where you think they belong, they are gonna um, turn themselves right back around and go where they need to, where they need to go. So we're just kind of helping to move them across roads, out of danger and then letting them take it from there. Um, and absolutely this, this goes without saying for this bunch here, but um, you should never take a wild turtle home. They belong in the wild. Um, there are so many um, rescues. If you want a pet turtle, there are so many turtles that can't be released for one reason or another. And it is not hard to find a pet turtle from a rescue organization if if you want to, to have a turtle at home, but don't ever take a wild turtle um, 
these turtles, some of them don't even reach reproductive maturity until they're more than 20 years old. And so the females that are on the roads are elders and they, um, their nests, most of them are eaten by raccoons and other predators. And so their strategy is that they have to keep living year after year and dig nest after nest um, to, to ensure some survival for their offspring. And so when we um, accidentally hit a turtle on the road or um, take one home, it has a, an outsized impact on their population as a whole, even just every turtle counts. So um, slow down, give them a helping hand, do not take them home with you. Thank you, Brett. That was really, really informative and good job, everybody. Now we know if we see a turtle, we're just going to put it across the road. If we cross it across the road, if it's safe for us and then put it down in the direction it was going. All right, here's a question. Whoa, this is, looks like, like stay puff marshmallows or something. Walking the trails on Pondicherry Park in Bridgeton, Mass, we, come, we came across this mushroom that looked like it had just come out of the baking oven. Any ideas? The second picture looks similar, but more of a clam shape. I tried to get the underside using the selfie camera. I think that's a great use of a selfie camera. All right, John, you fun guy. What's up with this really very uh, attractive bakey looking mushroom? Yeah, well, uh, this is a cool photo that does kind of look like, yeah, you know, Pillsbury dough rising or something like that. Um, and uh, this is a great example of what young polypores look like when they first emerge as fruiting bodies from uh, the tree or log where the where you know mycelium is established. So you'll often see this after it's been raining and you have the right conditions and certainly in the spring after, you know, conditions like we've had recently, uh, it's a good time to be looking out for all kinds of mushrooms appearing right now this time of year. Um, and it can definitely be tricky to identify polypores when they're at that earliest stage. When they first start emerging, they just kind of have that smooth white pore surface, and you can't always see the distinguishing characteristics that you're going to see on the top of the fruiting body as they get older. But there are some clues, and that lower photo that has a slightly more mature fruiting body does give me a pretty strong uh, sense of what this probably is. Um, uh, another great clue is that I believe this is hemlock bark, if you're looking carefully at where the, um, you know, the mushrooms are emerging on the top. And that's always a great uh, bit of evidence when you're trying to identify mushrooms, is looking at what kind of trees they're growing from. And the lower fruiting body, you can see how uh, the mushroom is starting to spread out a little bit from the point where it's emerging. And you can see that orange color on the surface that looks kind of shiny, kind of lacquered in appearance. And that's really the big clue that gave me uh, the best idea of what this probably is. So I'm gonna guess that these are young uh, hemlock varnish shelf mushrooms, AKA reishi. They're pretty famous as a medicinal uh, mushroom. There's two closely related species. And this is the one that grows on hemlock uh, trees, Ganoderma tsuge, the uh, species name even refers to the genus of hemlock trees that it grows from. So it's an important decomposer uh, mushroom. It's found throughout North America and around the world, including you know Japan and China and Russia and lots of places because the spores disperse in the winds. So that's why we sometimes use the Japanese name. It's been used uh, medicinally there for uh, thousands of years, and you can still go to your local co-op and find you know reishi teas and all kinds of things like that. Um, and some people like to ask about, well, how do you harvest them, and you know when would be the right time. Um, these ones are just beginning to grow, so you would definitely want them to grow a little more. And as they get larger, you're going to see that beautiful orange reddish color on the surface that's just really shiny and lacquered like ceramic kind of looking and that's really a distinguishing characteristic. Um, and you definitely want to harvest them uh, for, for medicine when they still have that nice white uh, margin around the edge nice and fleshy and soft and um, that's kind of the really nice stuff that you'd want to use. Uh, you want to kind of dry it out and then you can use it in tinctures and teas and things like that if you want to use it for its immunity boosting properties. So cool example of some young hemlock varnish shelves here. Wow, thanks. That was so, so interesting. Um, and I just want to give a shout out to John and anybody who's in the area. I know we have some people from far away, Oregon and Quebec, Ontario, Tennessee, but if you're local, keep your eye on the Harris Center calendar. John has, has been leading our Mushroom Meander, our Moral, Moral Quandary Club, um, once a month. He takes some breaks during the summer and some in the winter, but we are out with him. And, and that's just a 
little glimpse of all of what John knows about mushrooms, which is really, really a huge amount. And I always learn from him and I'm proud, John, because I recognized it for what it was based on my times going on those trips. So here's another mushroom question for you. So don't go anywhere. It says, we found these great orange mushrooms when wandering in the Hancock Hills after a rain. Do these mushrooms always stay bright orange or do they change to brown? Thanks from Tony. And maybe you could tell us what you think they are, John. All right. Well, this is a pretty famous species of mushroom. And my guess is that there's more a few than a few of you out there that might recognize this one. This is a highly sought after edible. It is one of the, the friendliest species, I would say, when you're just learning how to forage and how to identify ones that you're not going to mistake for anything that's poisonous. Uh, so this, without question, is chicken of the woods or sulfur shelf. Uh, which is another decomposer species that, you know, can grow from many different species of dead trees uh, or dying trees. It can be uh, a weak pathogen sometimes that can hasten the uh, heartwood rot of living trees. You do sometimes see that. Um, these, you know, mushrooms have this beautiful bright orange color. The underside, the pore surface is this lemon yellow color. So very distinctive, really not similar to any other uh, species. And it's kind of soft and fleshy when it's at this early stage of its growth. And to answer the question, uh, they do fade out over time. So if they've been growing throughout the summer and into the fall, they'll start to become kind of bleached out and whitish in color uh, as they get old. And probably at that point, they'd be no good to collect and eat as they get chewed up by bugs and dried out and everything like that. So uh, now would be the time to, to maybe harvest some of these or maybe give it another week or so to really you know, uh, fan out. It's always good to leave some fruiting bodies behind when you collect to continue to disperse the spores. But of course, the mycelium will continue to exist in that log there and survive and do its thing. So you can't sustainably harvest these types of mushrooms. But uh, that's a, a great find that you shared there. I was just going to say, um, we are kind of in a rainy spell, some of you might have noticed who are in the Northeast, so um, it is good mushroom growing season, and I've begun to notice a lot more fruiting, um, fruiting bodies of mushrooms in my walks around lately. John, have you been noticing that? Yeah, I've just begun to see the first of the summer mushrooms, so the first amanitas and rusulas yeah. and really common forest floor mushrooms that needed a little more moisture before they got going, so it's an exciting time of year to be out in the woods and looking for fungi. Great. Thanks so much, John. All right, let's go keep moving on. Oh, this is for me. I recognize this many scat questions here. It's about two to three inches in diameter. This looks like the color of spinach, but I can't imagine there is much dark green vegetation anywhere this soon. Any thoughts? Thanks from Beverly. So this was taken in April, as you can see. So it is early spring and this scat is a little bit hard to identify. And I'm going to suggest that I'm not 100% sure, but my thought on this is that it is from an herbivore, maybe a deer or possibly a moose, but I'm sticking more with deer because of the size of two to three inches is not that big. Why is it so dark green and goopy looking? Well, that's because deer have been spending the whole winter eating inner bark of trees. And that's what gives them their very woody pellet appearance for their scat. Um, we're all familiar with the more common type of scat that we find. But in the spring, when they begin to transition from eating that inner bark to finding the first greens of spring, and to find the first greens of spring, they typically go down towards wetlands. That's where the first greens kind of shoot up, the succulents. Um, and they eat them. And they're their body has to adjust to, from switching from eating a, a woody, very uh, woody diet to something that's more uh, lush and moisture. And just like any kind of animal, their scat's going to reflect the moisture content of the food that they're eating plus the what they're eating. So the green color is the vegetation that they've been eating. And the fact that it's so squishy and goopy is because they're eating these very succulent beginning greens of springtime. So that's my best thought. I will say another type of scat that can look like this, but is not usually green, is otter sprint. This is a little different than scat. A scat of otter is very crumbly. It's usually filled with fish scales and um, crustacean outer edges of the crustacean and things like that. Um, but they'll leave this very jellyish kind of goop 
near their scat. And that's a different type of, that's a kind of a marking area, but that is usually kind of a brown um, to clear to gray uh, kind of thing. And there's often little bits of fish in it as well, or fish bones or fish scales. So I'm, because of the color of being so green, I'm sticking with my herbivore. And I'm, if anybody has anything they want to add to that, I will just say as, as, a celebration of scat this evening. Miles has offered to sing us a little song about scat. Miles, do you mind? Oh my God, I forgot about this. <laughs> well, it starts with an S and it ends with a T. It comes out of you and it comes out of me. Now I know what you're thinking, you can call it that, but let's be scientific and call it scat. Scat out of the key to that about a bow. <laughs> yeah, baby, I love that song. And, and I think if we were in person, you would be getting a standing ovation for that. So I appreciate you being so risk taking and singing the scat song. And I will just add a new verse to it. I won't sing it. But I like to say, if you really want to know what an animal eats, take a good hard look at what it excretes. All right, moving along, Miles is like, that's enough about scat, but here it goes. This is also very gooey looking. I was at Ipswich River yesterday and found these egg masses in their vernal pool. Can you help me identify them? I'm pretty sure some, most, are spotted salamander. In the first photo, one of the masses has yellowish embryos. Pickerel frog? Also in the picture in the upper right-hand corner, looks like something different. This is from Jan and it was taken April 21st. And this is right up Brett's alley. Brett, what is up? Yeah, so there, um, there are what I think are two different species of egg mass here, but the top three pictures all look like the same, the same to me, but they look really different. It's, it's a really good illustration of how different these egg masses look when they are underwater versus when they are being held out of water um, in our hand and we can really see their texture. Um, so that texture is a real giveaway for spotted salamander eggs. Spotted salamander eggs have this kind of outer gelatinous envelope that's really firm, like, um, like jello. And sometimes it's clear and sometimes it's milky white. Um, and that's just a genetic difference, kind of like hair color, but that, that texture is really distinctive. And you can't always see that um, if, you're, if you don't have the eggs in hand, but there's another characteristic. Um, if you look at that egg mass in the top right-hand corner there, each of those individual embryos has this white halo around it, a disc. That's also really distinctive for spotted salamander. Um, it's just a membrane that surrounds the individual embryos. And the, the closer they get to hatching, the less distinctive that halo um, is. So those eggs there, I think, are pretty young, newly deposited. And the ones right below them in that person's hand are a little further along in development. You don't really see that membrane anymore there. The embryos are um, more distinctive and look more like little larvae instead of just eggs. But what was exciting to me, I mean, I'm always excited about spotted salamander eggs, um, but they are fairly common. We see them in a lot of vernal pools. But the bottom picture, the bottom left picture was exciting to me because this looks like a different species and a much less common species. So you might notice in that picture that that egg mass is um, much looser in texture. It, it doesn't have, it doesn't hold its shape. It's not holding together like jello. It's more of like a jelly consistency. And you can also see the embryos in that egg mass are much further along in their development. Yeah, that's a, that's a great example right there. You can, um, they're longer. They really look like they're close to hatching. If you zoomed in, you probably could even see the gills that are forming at the base of their neck. They have these really, these feathery appendages that um, serve as gills. And in April 21st, it'd be really unusual to see a spotted salamander egg mass that close to hatching um, because many of them are only just being deposited in um, mid-April. But there is another related salamander species um, the Jefferson blue spotted salamander complex that is a little bit more cold tolerant than spotted salamanders. And so they tend to come out earlier in the spring. And I think that's what that lower egg mass is. I think it's a, either a Jefferson salamander egg mass um, or a blue spotted salamander egg mass. They're, um, those two species hybridize a fair bit. Um, and so you can't necessarily tell um, blue spotted from Jefferson's and it's mostly assumed that what we're looking at in our neck of the woods are hybrids, but 
those have been in the pool longer. They're closer to hatching. Um, and they are a species of conservation concern in New Hampshire. So it's exciting to have found them alongside the more common spotted salamanders uh, in that vernal pool. So awesome find, Jan. Yeah, thank you, Jan. And thanks, Brett. That was really fascinating. And I love that you're such a salamander egg expert. It's really cool. So yay. All right, let's see what's next. I'll, one follow-up to that is that our, uh, there's a great guide on our website, and it's actually the most seen web part of our website you know, at the Harris Center. So if you're interested in a great amphibian egg guide, we have one. Uh, it just takes a little searching on our website. That's great. Brett, maybe you could put the link right in the chat. Thank you. Yay. That's great. Thanks, Miles, for reminding that. Ooh, look at this. Large caterpillars are starting to appear on the blueberries on the edge of Nubanuset. What are they? Do they eat blueberry leaves? This is from that famous person, Anonymous, and its picture was June 11th. So, Jenna, you're an entomologist, and I have a feeling you know a lot about this caterpillar. Can you tell us about it, and should we worry about our blueberry leaves? Um, yeah, so I'll first tell you what it is. It's a forest tent caterpillar, and um, this turns into a not very exciting brown moth in a little while. Um, and these are going to, they overwinter as a cluster of eggs sort of cemented to a twig, usually on sugar maple or oak. And they spend the winter like that. And it, you wouldn't even guess they were insect eggs if you didn't know, it, it, they're hard as a rock when they, the female lays them around the twig and then sort of the secretions cement it. Then they'll hatch in the spring and start feeding. Um, they will feed on, they, they feed on a lot of different hardwood leaves, um, but apparently uh, when they're wandering to try and find a new host plant, they often will just sort of eat what they're passing by. And blueberry, if blueberry is there, they yeft up, they, they will eat it. Yes. Um, my favorite thing, though, about these caterpillars, um, as well as their close relative, the eastern tent caterpillar, is that they all use trail pheromones which is fairly uncommon, or at least that as far as we know, in, um, in caterpillars. So what's fun about these is that it says they're a tent caterpillar. The, the forest tent caterpillar actually doesn't form a tent. They just happen to be in the family of tent caterpillars. They form a little um, silken mat. And I love that in all the science literature about it, they, it's called a bivouac. <laughs> so I just think it's cute that they're gonna bivouac together at night. Um, so the caterpillars all like live together and that's a protective um, group behavior, which again is fairly unusual in the caterpillar world. And they'll stay at the little bivouac and then when it's time for them to go eat, they'll spread out. And as they go, they will drag the last few segments of their body and they'll leave a little silk. And as they do that, they're leaving a little silk sort of like little breadcrumbs for their family members saying, I'm heading this way to go eat. So you might follow me. So others might. And then on the way back to the bivouac, they will leave another little trail and they might say, I found, and that little trail might send a message of, I found really good food out there. You should go back that way. Or it might say, I ate it all up. Don't bother. So it's a super interesting um, trail pheromone in this caterpillar as well as the Eastern tent caterpillar. And they also leave a different pheromone um, component that directs you to either their bivouac in this species or their actual tent in the Eastern tent caterpillar. So oh my that's my fun. I was so excited to see this because I love this about these. And the other fun thing, and this may not be true anymore, but 20 years ago when I was teaching outdoor education in Connecticut, I read somewhere that the blue paper mate ballpoint pen had a component of the trail pheromone of this caterpillar. And so I took us, I went and bought some and I drew a big circle and then I went and found some of these and I put them on there and sure enough, they just walked in a circle. Oh my God. No. <laughs> yeah. All right. Everybody has some homework. You got to yeah. get a blue paper. They probably pen. changed it now. No, so I'm going to get everyone it. excited. So right. but yeah, blue paper mate. A blue paper mate pen and a ballpoint. A ballpoint pen and this little caterpillar mm -hmm. and then um let's... or an eastern tent caterpillar which is sort of similar you can google it it has instead of having if we zoomed in on this picture um you can sort of see that the white marks going down its back look like a high heel boot footprint and that to me footprint forest tent caterpillar ff that helps me remember 
and the eastern tent caterpillar just has a line. So wow. if you find one of these that has little, looks like little white high-heeled boot footprints down its back, that's a forest tent these, caterpillar. These boots were made for walking, I guess, on a yeah. big, big point. Okay, people, if you do this, send us a video and we will post them. So well, we if, it looking, if it still happens, I mean, maybe happens. they changed their formula. Why would they change their formula? They haven't changed Because they didn't anything. want little tent caterpillars to be wandering around and like... What? I had kids write their names in cursive and that's a little tent caterpillar would like, tick, 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 tick. very cute. Oh, I love yeah. that. The, you know, I love Ask a Naturalist because just when you think you found out something that is so cool and then the next thing comes up and you find out something so cool, it just keeps going. So thanks, Jenna. And let's see what our next question is. Oh, this is a question for all of you. Um, it is butterfly season, just like we had turtles crossing the road and you might be noticing a lot of butterflies. We are gonna give you a poll on how many species of butterflies are in New Hampshire. So here's the choices. Are, is there four species, 63 species, 98 species, 125 species, or 1,000? So, all right, Miles. Let's see, can you tell us what the results were and then what the answer is? Yeah, we had just a couple, uh, one vote for four, four votes for 63, five votes for 98, three votes for 125, and four votes for 1,000. So right. the 98 was the most common of our, of the votes. And Miles? How many are there? Drum roll, 125 according to Google. <laughs> yeah, 125. I mean, I don't feel like I've ever seen 125 different types of butterflies. So to me, I'm thinking I better start paying attention. And that reminds me, Brett, we have a really cool butterfly project going on uh, at the Harris Center and across the state. You wanna tell everybody about the butterfly survey? Yeah, uh, New Hampshire is starting a new um, butterfly monitoring network that's um, reaching out to all the community scientists out there, people who are into butterflies and doing surveys throughout the state. And we're hosting one in the Harris Center Super Sanctuary uh, on July 22nd. And it's basically to get a snapshot of all the the butterflies that we can find to count them and identify them. And then also there's an iNaturalist project. So even if you don't go out with us on July 22nd, but you want to contribute to the network, you can take pictures. Even if you don't know what they are, the beauty of iNaturalist is that other people will help you identify what you have found. Um, and they'll automatically, if you take the, that picture in New Hampshire, um, it'll automatically get scooped into the iNaturalist project for the New Hampshire Butterfly Monitoring Network. And we also have a field foray for local folks um, Originally scheduled for this Saturday, very likely to be rescheduled because of rain, because butterflies are not out and about in the rain, but um, hopefully rescheduled for next Saturday. So if you want to learn butterflies alongside some really great people um, and you live nearby, you can sign up for that on our website. I'll put the link in the chat, but lots of opportunities. And then later on this summer, we'll be doing monarch caterpillar counts and also um, after that monarch butterfly tagging in September. So there's Lots of cool butterfly community science happening. So um, exciting. Yeah, it's awesome. So. Yeah, thanks, Brett. And um, Brett and I and a few other staff have been learning our butterflies and they're really hard. So um, we're going to keep practicing and hopefully one day feel like we can identify some butterflies. Whoa, what the heck is this? An unusual observation found in a vernal pool in Harrisville on April 25th, 2023. All right, well, this is like was a hard question to figure out who to give it to because it looks like, could it have been a, a bug? Could be some salamander thing? Because it was found near a vernal pool, I'm going to go with my vernal pool person, and that's Brett. Brett, can you shed some light on what this strange item is? I can. I actually sent this one in because I was, uh, so um, I don't know if pleased is the word, but I, I was intrigued to find it. Um, I spend a lot of time looking about in vernal pools in the spring, looking for frogs and salamanders and their eggs, and also for all the invertebrates that live in vernal pools. And um, mostly the spotted salamanders and other vernal pool salamanders are mostly active after dark. So even if I'm out there, if I'm out there looking in the daylight, I don't usually expect to see adult spotted salamanders swimming around. Every once in a while, they surprise me. And so when I was at this particular vernal pool looking at eggs, 
I got really excited because I saw what I thought was um, a live adult spotted salamander. I spotted this tail peeking out from some leaves at the bottom of the pool. And I went to um, pick it up because I wanted to take its picture. And um, it was a tail, but it was not attached to a salamander anymore. And that's what this is. So I pulled it out of the pool and I put it on a rock to take a picture of. This is the tail of a spotted salamander. I should have put some, I did, I'm not, I haven't um, learned what I should from Ask a Naturalist because I did not put anything for scale in this photo. Like we're always telling people to do with scat and track photos, but um, it was about, I don't know, five or five inches long, maybe six inches long. And part of what's confusing about it is that um, a spotted salamander has yellow spots, yellow polka dots. And so these are not yellow, they look kind of bluish. And that is a factor of um, after they die, their spots fade and they kind of turn bluish in color. So this salamander had been dead for a little while um, before, or this tail had been detached and, and um, for a while before I found it. And I'm guessing that um, this is the result of a barred owl. Uh, they do a lot of hunting in vernal pools in the spring and they, they will, there's some really great trail cam videos out there where they will kind of come down into the vernal pool, shuffle their, their feet through and then just pick frogs and salamanders up in their talons and eat them. So um, I'm guessing that, and I, this, is an, this is from a vernal pool close to where I live. We have lots of barred owls hanging out and I'm guessing a barred owl ate the rest of the salamander and ditched the tail for some reason and left it there for me to find. So I've never found this before. And I've been mucking around in vernal pools for almost 20 years. So it was a pretty exciting discovery, even if it's a bit gruesome. Yeah, thanks <laughs> yeah so it does much look like sharing. scat. <laughs> it does look like scat. But yeah, thanks for sharing. That was really very interesting. And I just have a question for you, a follow-up. I do know that some salamanders are able to regenerate their tail. Are spotted salamanders one of the salamanders that can regenerate a tail? I that's a really good question. I would guess so. I don't know for sure, but I um, I did have some correspondence once with a biologist in Mississippi who had found um, a marbled salamander, which is a relative of the spotted salamander that had been had one of its feet run over, just its foot, and it lost the foot. And this fellow kept it for a while, and he watched as the foot regrew, and he took pictures. Um, every few weeks and he sent me all his he sent me a bunch of the pictures so I would guess that if um, if it can regenerate a foot it can probably regenerate a tail and if a marbled salamander can do it a spotted salamander probably can too fascinating thank you and I'm very intrigued by what else comes into your inbox <laughs> if you had my inbox it would be mostly pictures of scat okay Oh, I love this photograph, Tricia. Great job capturing it. Let's see what she says. The leaf here is curled in on itself and must be a place where an egg was laid by some insect. What is curious is the number of ants that are investigating the leaves, perhaps to eat or drink something. There are several of these leaves all being investigated by ants and the leaf is of a burning bush. So Jenna, what, what's going on here? Who's in I that love little... that she got such a good picture of this. So um, you're probably all familiar or might be with the ant aphid interaction where an aphid will feed on the phloem of a plant and the excess um, liquidy sugar water that we call honeydew comes out its rear and the ant wants to eat that. So it protects the aphids and the ant comes and we call it milking the aphids, even though it's not milk and, you know, they're not actually doing that. But anyway, um, what I think is that curled up in here, um, is some other type of homoptera, which is the order that includes, which, which means the true bugs, which are those that are aphids and leafhoppers and other things like that, that are phloem feeding insects. So I'm guessing that it curled up because as you have a bunch of insects that are sucking the phloem out of a leaf, there it curls in on itself as it sort of um, gets the juices sucked out of it, so to speak. And the ant is coming along because all of those little critters inside are producing honeydew. So that's the only reason I can think that ants would be repeatedly, like she describes, coming to it, uh, a leaf like this and a bunch of ants coming back and forth because they're getting the juicy, delicious honeydew. 
Um, and often I find in the summertime, I always plant um, sunflowers. I just love all the bees, love the sunflowers. And every single year on the underside, I start seeing this sort of like curling of the sunflower leaves and you turn them over and sure enough, you'll see little tiny um, insects in the order Homoptera. And they are just sort of, they stick their straw-like mouth part in and they just suck the flow amount. And then out the rear comes the excess sugary liquid and ants just gobble that stuff up. So um, Jenna, that doesn't hurt the little aphid. What, the ant eating? Oh, no. Yeah. No, no, no it's sort of a symbiotic. Well, yes, it's that? actually called, you ready for a new vocabulary word, Susie? Bring it on, bring it Rofobiosis. on. Rophobiosis. Whoa, whoa, say it again. Prophobiosis, P-R-O-P-H-O, biosis. And this, I, I'm sure I'm not going to define it perfectly, but it has to do with one animal either getting food directly from another or feeding another directly without any sort of intermediary, like in between. So it's just a, a symbiotic relationship between the two. Um, the reason it helps the little insect under there is that it takes away that liquid that would then otherwise sit on the leaf surface and get moldy. Um, and that's not so good for the plant and therefore not good for the flow and feeder. And then blah, 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 blah. Got it. Um, yeah. Can you put the word in the chat so people can see how it's sure. spelled? That's great. Yep. Wow. I just, the, the insect world is beyond fascinating. <laughs> it's a little scary too. Okay. All right. This is a question I'm going to turn to everybody. It's a little bit of a story. So here's the story. Dear naturalist, what do you think is trying to get into our pre-compost pile pails? We've been emptying dinner scraps, no meat, into metal buckets outside our front door on their way out to the compost. My husband upended a large vinyl flower pot over one of the buckets and put a thick piece of wood with some weight on top. For the past week or so, something has been trying to get in. It knocks the bucket a little askew, but not over. And yesterday, it left scratches in the bucket. In a separate email, I'll attach the picture. We've put the picture in so you can see the picture. The current location of the bucket is a breezeway between the front door and the garage. We live in Marlboro, and my husband doesn't think it's a bear because he doesn't know of any bears spotted around here. He thinks a bear could topple it over easy. He doesn't think a bear would leave those marks on a flower pot. What do you think and what do you recommend? Thanks for your attention. So take a moment, everybody. And if you have a theory on who's been trying to crack the code of the compost pile, put it right in the chat. And I'll take that from other uh, Harris Center naturalists too. We're getting some choice, some ideas up here. Raccoon seems to be... A very popular response, raccoon or possum. Ooh, that's a new player. Raccoon is winning the, uh, the votes here. We're all in agreement that it's not a bear because what do we know? A bear wouldn't just knock it over. It would just, it would like rip it apart. It would get right into the compost. So we can eliminate the bear as the suspect. And the fact that it's kind of knocked over with these scratchy marks seems pretty like something smaller. Um, and raccoon is a good thought. A possum is a good thought. I had one other thought and that was a skunk. Um, skunks are known to have compost and they're not as uh, agile with their hands as raccoons. Um, but I don't necessarily know that we're going to figure out the answer. But in terms of what they could do um, is probably not put their compost out in the breezeway. That would be my suggestion because you definitely don't want to encourage a wild animal to be coming up onto your deck or your breezeway, especially if it is something like a skunk or an opossum or a raccoon or really anybody. So I would highly suggest for them to uh, keep their compost inside. And, and sometimes what I do is I put it in my freezer overnight if I'm not going to go out to the compost until the morning and then I just take it out in the morning out of, dump it into uh, my compost pile. Does anybody, any of the other naturalists want to chime in on any thoughts on recommendations? 
Right. If you, my only recommendation isn't so much about stopping the animals from getting to your compost, but if you want to figure out who's doing it, a trail cam would be a great tool to set up gear, just put, you know, have it focused on your, on your bins here and just see and set it to either photo or video. And probably you'll, you'll, you'll get some footage of the culprit. If we have you... had trail cams on our composts sometimes just for fun. And we get all kinds of animals that come through there in the night. So. Yeah, if you do end up doing that, um, I don't know if the person who sent this in is on this call this evening on the Zoom, but if you do, if you want to send in the culprit, we would be very excited to see that and we would share it out. So um, keep us posted, but I, I, I do recommend that you don't put your compost on your breezeway overnight, even to get a good trail cam shot. Just put it either directly right into your compost or wait until the next day to take it out. So I think that might be our last Excuse question you. for this is evening. It? I have one follow up, Susie. Sure. Um, is there anything in a typical compost that those critters might be seeking out that we could remove from our compost? I don't know, like eggshells or. Something yeah, like that. I mean, it's great that they're not putting meat scraps into their compost. I mean, that's that's a good thing. But really, um, animals like just about much any anything that's in the compost. Um, you know, half-eaten apples. Um, yeah, eggshells are a big thing. Um, I know that when I put eggshells in my compost, I often come out in the morning and see the, the eggshells are out of the compost as though something had removed it and licked them clean. And I'm thinking probably a raccoon because raccoons love the eggs. Um, so yeah, you could crush up your eggshells. That's another solution. Instead of keeping them whole, just kind of smash them up so that it's not so easy for them to get to. But I love that we compost and I'm going to big encourage of composting. And a good thing is, you know, putting a cover on your compost is a good way to keep the animals out. So great. All right. Um, Miles, is that our last one? Yeah. Thank you guys so much for joining us. We have some news about Ask a Naturalist. We are deciding that we're only going to have Ask a Naturalist um, kind of like, Brett, you had a good name for it. You want to tell everybody, this is such a great idea. We were thinking of um, shifting it to kind of a year end thing once a year, but kind of like the best questions, the most intriguing natural mystery history natural history mysteries that we've received kind of like a year in review or, um, you know, a top 10 list for the, the, the past year so that it would cover all the seasons. And we're thinking that December might be a good time for this because that's when people are starting to reflect on the, the year that has just gone by. And so we um, won't have one this fall, but we will schedule one, I think, for December and it'll be like the greatest hits of, yeah. of the past year. So. Stay I tuned love it. For that. Yeah. And if you want, you can send some of your pictures in too. Maybe we'll have a like a picture slideshow, best shots of the year too. So send those right in to us. Thank you guys so much. This is always such a treat. We're not giving out any exams at the end today. And we really appreciate you guys for joining in the polls and sending in your questions and listening to us get excited about things like what was that word, Jenna? Propophis. Propobiosis. <laughs> Propobiosis. And then I love that Eric said that when the bird, the turkey leaves the nest, it's recessing. I kind of love that too. <laughs> As a mom, I can totally relate. I need to recess. Anyway, yeah. on that note, have a very happy summer and send us your, um, your natural history mysteries. And we'll see you all in December with a cup of eggnog and some good cheer. Thank you guys. <laughs> Take good care. Bye. Bye all.